Welcome, Bhante. It is really a pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to have this interview with you today. Thank you. And let me begin by introducing uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey. Bhante Vimala Ramsey is a Mahathira monk. He has been a monk for more than 35 years. Yeah. And uh, he's currently the abbot of Tamasuka Meditation Center. And he is one of the monks that I have met whose teachings are based on the earliest and most comprehensively recorded teachings of Buddha, uh, straight from the suttas, as he says. And uh, why it's a very special moment for me is because for a brief period, I had the opportunity to have a temporary ordination as a Samanera monk while at uh, Dhammasukha Meditation Center with uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey. So, Bhante, very welcome once again. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this conversation with you. And to begin with, let me ask you the most obvious question one can ask a monk. But the, from your point of view and from, uh, from the wisdom of all the knowledge you have and the experience you have, what really is mindfulness? <laughs> mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. In other words... Your mind is with your object of meditation, and it gets distracted. How did that happen? It didn't all of a sudden jump over. Oh, yeah. It's part of a process, and when your mindfulness is strong, you can see what happens first, and what happens after that, and what happens after that. So when your mind is on your meditation, it's very still then it starts wobbling, your mind starts wobbling, and you start having tiny little thoughts, and they get bigger and bigger until you're distracted all the way. Mindfulness is being able to observe that. Great. And if, you, if I might draw a little further on that question is, how does sharpening mindfulness help lay people, People who may not be monks and are not monastics may not even have a formal meditation practice. Well, be more aware of what you're thinking while you're thinking it and how your mind gets distracted. Right. You're, when you're able to see that you're reading something and all of a sudden you're thinking of something else, yeah. you catch that more quickly and come back so you, you start training your mind to stay with what you want to be, uh, your attention to be on. Yeah. And, and that is so important because one of the greatest challenges in the modern life is of all the distraction that is coming at us, both from the world outside and from inside. So I think that is perhaps uh, a very important quality for us to cultivate. Yes. And uh, now switching from mindfulness to completely the other end of the spectrum, in the Buddhist philosophy, uh, if we can call it that, or uh, there is the concept which is approximately translated as craving. Right? I would like you to explain in layman terms a little bit about what is craving and why is there so much conversation in Buddha's teaching about craving. Okay, this is, this is actually easy. <laughs> okay, we're made up of five different things. Mm -hmm. The psychophysical process. We have a physical body. We have feeling, not emotional feeling, just feeling. feeling yeah. Pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. We have perception. Perception and feeling are always together. When a painful feeling arises, your mind says that's painful. That's perception that said that. Or if it's pleasant, that's pleasant. You have thoughts, you have consciousness. Okay, a feeling arises. It's either painful or, or uh, pleasant. <clears throat> as soon as that arises, right after that feeling, there is something that occurs in your mind, and that is craving. What is craving? Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. Right, yeah. If it's a pleasant feeling, I like it. If it's a painful feeling, I don't like it. 
Now, the key of this is I. <laughs> I is a false belief in a personal self. That's mm -hmm. when you're taking something personally. Right. That's the definition of craving. <laughs> I like it, I don't like it. How do you recognize craving when it arises? That's key. And you'll notice that every time you have a thought, every time a feeling arises, every kind, any kind of thing distracts you a bit, you, you have tension and tightness in your head. Now, your, your brain is like this. Mm -hmm. And you have a membrane that goes around your brain. The meninges, right? And that's the meninges. Yeah. Meninges is basically just a bag. Mm -hmm. So when, every time there's a thought or a feeling or a sensation, your brain expands a little bit against that meninges and it causes a tension or tightness. That's how you recognize craving when it arises. A lot of people that are teaching meditation, they don't tell you about this. Craving, yeah, it's not brought up. Yep. And so they don't notice it. Yeah. But after a period of time, they start complaining about having a lot of tightness in their head. That is craving. craving yeah. So what do you do to let go of the craving? You relax, relax that tension and tightness in your head. And when you relax, you'll feel kind of like an expansion happening and a softening of your mind. That is called the cessation of craving. So every time you have a distracting thought, you recognize that your mind is not on your object of meditation. You release that distraction. How do you release it? You release it by not keeping your attention on that distraction. Then you relax. You're letting go of that tension and tightness now. Right after that, your mind becomes very clear, very bright, and there are no distractions. That's pulling your attention away. So this is what we call the pure mind. mind. Yep. Because there's no distractions, you have let go of that craving, now you bring up something that's wholesome. You bring up a smile. We re-smile a lot. What does a smile do? It does a couple of things. One, the more you can smile during the day, the better your mindfulness during the day okay. becomes. Absolutely. Absolutely true. And you bring that smiling, pure mind back to your object of meditation. You return to your object. Now, I teach both kinds of meditation. I, I teach more than one kind, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, I teach loving kindness meditation, and I also teach mindfulness of breathing. And there are other meditations that I teach also. The thing that you want to understand is you want to keep your attention on your object of meditation. It doesn't matter how many times your mind gets pulled away. Just because your mind got pulled away doesn't mean you have to be frustrated or you're a failure. That happens until you get more and more used to staying with your object of, your meditation. Object of meditation, with loving kindness or with the breath. Yeah. 
but both of these kinds of meditation has the smile in it. <laughs> okay. True. The smile, yeah. it improves your mindfulness, so you become much more aware mm -hmm. much more quickly. Yeah. And your mind is much more at ease when you're smiling and it can bring joy up. Yeah. Joy is a happy feeling, there's some excitement in it, and you start going, Ah, oh, this is why I wanted to meditate. <laughs> this is this is the reason. This is really good. This is good. Yeah. So the more you can smile, the better your mindfulness is, the faster your progress is with the meditation. There was a lot to pack in an answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that is how it is to talk to you about the I always say it's like drinking from a fountain of wisdom. No matter how much you drink, you will always remember there was so much that flowed by you cannot <laughs> hold on to. But I, I think uh, in your uh, answer, you, you brought out three very important aspects, and I will dive a little bit deeper into each one of them one at a time. You, know, okay. you talked you talk about the concept of no permanent self, the anatta or right. anatman from the Buddha doctor. We'll return to that. And I think you summarized the six-hour technique and yeah. the relax and the smile step as well. But from craving, I want to bridge to something that lay people have difficulty understanding, especially in some sense uh, when we talk about the Four Noble Truths and the core teachings of Buddha, the concept of suffering as translated from Dukkha arises. Now suffering in colloquial language, as people understand, has to do with pain and something unpleasant and so on yeah. and so forth. However, there is this very very different degree of richness and depth in what Buddha is saying when he talks about dukkha yeah. and with very approximately translates to suffering. So I thought, let me, let me take a segue to that and ask you, what is dukkha? How would you explain that to someone? Um, according to the suttas, it's not getting what you want. <laughs> That's very well said. Wanting something and then not getting yeah. what you want. Or getting something that you don't want. Want, yeah. Both are dukkha. Okay. It's holding on yeah. and taking it personally. personally yeah. That's what the, the craving actually is. Yeah. Now, when the Buddha was talking about meditation, mm -hmm. He said that there's three parts to the meditation. Yeah. The first part is practicing your generosity. Sanatri, yep. Now, the thing with the generosity is people think that it has to be something that's physical. And it can be mental, too. Mm -hmm. If you say something kind to someone else, you're giving them your love and happy feeling. Yeah. So generosity is not just about physically, I'm going to give this to you. Two, yeah. And the more you practice your generosity, your kindness towards other people around you, the lighter your mind becomes. The second part of meditation is keeping the five precepts. Five <laughs> precepts are lust or greedy mind, hatred or aversion sure. mind, yeah. sleepiness, dullness, restlessness, anxiety, and doubt. When any of these five things come into your mind, you're no longer meditating. Okay. Now you're getting caught up in your thoughts about one of these things. Now, the Buddha gave the uh, five precepts as a recommendation. It's not commandments. a commandment <laughs> at all. The yeah. Buddha never gave any commandments. commandments he, yeah. he just gave recommendations. <laughs> and the closer you can be to keeping your precepts without breaking them, it turns into a protection for you. 
and it also makes your my mind more happy. happy. Yeah. Now, when you break a precept, let's say you tell a little white lie, that's still telling a lie. So, when you tell, or say something that's not true, a small voice in your mind says, that's not true. I shouldn't have said, said that. that. Yeah. And you take that personally. You feel guilty because you said it, but you shine it on. I mean, you, you just uh, don't think about it but anymore, it, yeah. except when you're trying to purify your mind through meditation. meditation. Absolutely. And when you purify your mind through meditation, you're going to have to recognize this hindrance as a wrong belief and a guilty feeling in a personal self. As soon as you begin to let go and relax that craving, you've purified your mind. You've let go of that unwholesome feeling and your mind is clear. Yeah. Your mind is bright. Your mind is very alert. And then you bring up something wholesome, a smile. A smile. Yeah. And bring that smiling, wholesome mind back to your object of meditation. This is how you progress in meditation. This is how you let go of any kind of distraction that pulls your attention away. The more you can do this, recognize that your mind is distracted, release the distraction, relax the tightness caused by that distraction, re-smile, return to your object of meditation, and repeat staying with your object of meditation as long as you can. Now, <clears throat> what I said a little while ago was, just because your mind gets distracted doesn't mean you're a failure. It's just what minds do. It, it's just the nature of mind. Right, yeah. So when you relax, you let it be there by itself. You don't keep your attention on it. You don't make a big deal out of any kind of thing that pulls your attention away. I don't care if it's sadness or anger or fear or anxiety. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is what you do with what arises in the present the moment. So, if you fight with what's happening in the present moment, you don't like this feeling of anger or sadness or dissatisfaction of some sort, and you try to control your feeling with your thoughts, you're going to have those thoughts come up a lot, yeah. bigger and more intense. And that feeling is going to get bigger because you're feeding it with your attention. That's why you need to see that distraction, let it be there. Don't keep your attention on it anymore. Don't make it into a big deal. Every time you make it into a big deal, the pain becomes bigger, yep. more intense. It takes a little practice to be able to do this, but as you start to see how this process actually works, it gets easier and easier. And as a result, you start letting go of your heavy emotional upsets, your dislikes and your dissatisfactions. You start not getting so caught up in them. If you use release, 
relax, smile, and come back to, if it's with your daily activities, smiling some more. <laughs> You're following the Eightfold Path. So, if you have 50 distractions while you're sitting, and 50 times you let it be and you relax and smile and come back, that is a good meditation. If you try to push it away, I don't want this, I, I, I hate this feeling, I, I want that person to do something and they're not doing it and I'm mad. If you don't get it, make a big deal out of that feeling, you allow it to be, you relax, smile, and come back, you start developing your personality so that you have more happiness and joy coming up. And this leads to a quieter mind, a mind that's more relaxed, at ease, and accepting. Thank you, Bhante. That was a great answer. And in that answer was also the answer to one more question that I had planned for Bhante about explaining the six hours. And I think we will close with that later, but I think a lot of gist of it. I almost felt like a feeling of deja vu. I remember <laughs> when I was in the robes uh, at the SMC, on the second day, uh, you came up for lunch and the, the only instruction you gave me at that point was, you are not smiling enough. <laughs> you need to <laughs> smile more. So it was almost like a deja vu. Uh, I, 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 now we've talked about craving, we've talked about suffering, we've talked about how to deepen the meditation practice. I'd like to ask you about this concept. There is a lot of conversation in the self-development world about self-unfoldment, self-actualization, self-realization, self-development. And then we have the uh, we have the Buddhist principle, if I may say, or uh, concept of anatta or anatman uh, in another language of not self. And I don't give it that definition. Okay. <laughs> okay, because that's really confusing. Yes, it is. It certainly I is. I give it the definition of seeing the impersonal nature. Yeah. No personal self. No personal self. Yes. Yeah. There's still self. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's not not self. Not self. Yeah. But seeing the impersonal nature is what happens as soon yeah. as you let go of the craving. Yeah. The and your mind is very clear. Yeah. And you're seeing this as a process. Right. Rather than a personal yeah. attachment. Yeah. In, in fact, that brings me to, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with Chris Cullen at the Oxford University, and we were talking about uh, a not personal self, and I, and I mentioned to him, perhaps one of the major source of suffering is the craving for an I. Yeah. That, you know, the, the, the concept and belief that there is a real me, you know, there is a personal me, and from there, you know, the, the cascade of that process starts. So it, what you said about uh, not personal self is a very astute way to articulate that. Yeah, and, and, and it's a lot more easy to understand, understand. Yeah. especially when you're doing the practice at that time. At that time. And see for yourself. Yeah. That's why I tell a lot of people that come and they want to learn meditation with yeah. me, I tell them that they are their own teacher. teacher. Yeah, yeah. And that's important. Yeah because you have to see this for yourself, Self. and it's not an intellectual <laughs> uh, practice. Yeah, that is true. And uh, it's, in many cases, meditation gets confused with contemplation. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 the word meditation itself has uh, become so democratized in some sense and so generalized mm -hmm. that sometimes it does amaze me, stuff that people do and then they say, that's their meditation. So, uh, yeah. so I, know I, I get the point about being able to do everything mindfully, but uh, but uh, by staying in the moment, by f focusing on what you're doing, not getting distracted with your thoughts or emotions that may come up or other forms of feeling. But to classify everything as meditation seems to have become fashionable. 
Well, I just got through writing a book, Life is Meditation. Patient Meditation, meditation is Life. It's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. And yeah. it is part of living. Living, yeah. You have hindrances arise yeah. whether you're sitting in meditation or you're out for a walk. Right. You still have hindrances that can arise. So you can do, you can let go of the pain of that by practicing the six hours. Six hours, yeah. And, and, and on that point, uh, we, we've talked a lot about how we can sit with meditation, how we can use six hours of meditation. And I opened my conversation by asking about mindfulness. I think it's appropriate. Let me ask you about okay. what is meditation and how would you explain to someone who's never meditated before? Well, meditation is being able to observe how mind's attention actually works. Works, yeah. And how to let go of the suffering that we can get caught up in, the mm -hmm. boredom, the sloth and torpor, uh, sloth and torpor the, 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 the restlessness, yeah. the, all kinds of different Hindrances, things. Yeah. Uh, the, the greed of, I want this to be the way I want it to be <laughs> when I want it <laughs> that <two> way. way. <laughs> and when it's not, there is suffering. Suffering, yeah, true. Yeah. But every time you try to fight with the present, yeah. you're causing yourself suffering. Oh, absolutely. The present will still be here, but with suffering. What <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you are. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well said. And... Uh, so, in the in the Buddhist doctrine, there's also a lot of conversation around enlightenment, right? Yeah. And uh, um, and there's been a lot of commentary around it also. And there's there's marked difference in how enlightenment is in some way tendentially referred to in the suttas, and how later on in Vishuddhimaga there is a lot of commentary around it. So I'd love to hear from you what your view of uh, a very basic question: What really is enlightenment? I tell you something you don't know, I've enlightened you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't call what the Buddha teaches enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I call it awakening. Awakening. Because we're walking around yeah. in a dream, yeah. in a dream of our own uh, mishmash of thoughts and feelings yeah. and, and yeah. got to do this. Got to do all, that. Yeah. All of the, those kind of yeah. things. When you become clear, yeah. you become more awake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you start to see how this process works. Yeah. And the clearer you become, the happier you become. Yeah. It, it, it is my understanding that the word Buddha literally means the fully awakened one. Right. Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I know that there's, uh, especially in America, yeah. there's people that think that that's his name. <laughs> yeah. Buddha, Buddha said Xavier, that. Buddha, Buddha said that. that. Yeah, yeah. No, it, yeah. It's an honorific. Yeah. It's yeah. how to be respectful when you say the Buddha. The Buddha, yeah. The awakened one. one. And your mind actually takes a step down when you do it in a sincere way. Yeah, yeah. And it just in interest of trivia, his name actually was Siddhartha Gautama, the, right. the, the prince uh, of the, the son of the king yeah. of the Sakya kingdom, also later on called Sakya Muni. Yeah. And in fact, in, in Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist cosmology, you study about many Buddhas that have preceded the Buddha, and there's also conversation about Maitreya Buddha, who's supposed to... Who will be coming. Who will, will be coming. So it, it, it's great that you clarified that, you know, for, for our listeners, that the Buddha is an honorific yeah. to refer to the fully awakened one. And, uh, and while we are talking about awakening, uh, in the world today, there is so much that is going on that I sometimes have this conversation with my students and I say, there's a lot of tranquilized obviousness in life. We just tend to run on an automatic pilot, putting one foot in front of the other, because of a conditioned mind that I got to do this, I got to do that, and the whole full catastrophe of life that we need to deal with. And, uh, and I also have a conversation with them about how uh, mindfulness and meditation can help people get out of that autopilot and find more compassion, more joy, more fulfillment, more equanimity. 
And so I was hoping that you could say something about the millennial generation, where uh, millennial generation, I mean, I know people have all sorts of comments about it, but I think they, they have been born into an environment with more distractions than ever before. And how yes, can and, they... Yes, and a lot of them are becoming more and more aware of the suffering that they're doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're, they're looking for a way, way to get to. out of that. Yeah, yeah, so true. One of the problems that people have with Buddhism is they think it's a religion. <laughs> and it, that's the farthest thing away from religion that there is. <laughs> this is mind science. <laughs> this is being able to look at how you treat yourself yeah. and how you cause your own pain. If you get angry at somebody and they say something you didn't like, yeah. Yeah. you wind up blaming them for yeah. making you angry. And, and, and the anger is happening where you are, not where they are. Right. In that moment of choice, you chose to be angry. Right. Yeah. And being mindful means letting go of that. that. Yeah, absolutely. So you don't get so caught up in your emotional upset. Now, uh, there is a feeling that arises, and right after that there's craving, you either let it go or not. not yeah. Right after that, you have uh, uh, clinging. clinging. Clinging is your thinking about, your yeah. opinions, your ideas, ideas, and taking what you said and thought very personally, and you really hold on to, <laughs> this is my opinion, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And that causes suffering in itself. But the thing right after that, yeah. this is what I call your habitual, emotional uh, behavior. You, it's your uh, I just lost what I was going to say that's okay yeah uh, it's your habitual tendencies Jeez. yeah now what does that mean I have a feeling come up let's say depression that seems to be a favorite yeah. <laughs> what is what is that feeling it's painful I don't like it. I want it to stop. Yeah. So, what you try to do is think with thoughts your depression and how you don't like it. Yeah. And you keep on coming back and the more you think about a painful thing, the bigger and more intense that pain yes. becomes. Yeah, yeah. So that's not the way to get rid of depression. I gave a talk for a psychiatrist yeah. and he said, well, how are you supposed to get rid of depression? I said, laugh. <laughs> well, he said, it's not funny. <laughs> and that made me laugh <laughs> because it is funny. It is at some level, yeah. Because you're caught yeah. and you don't see it. Mm -hmm. As soon as you laugh, you go from, I'm depressed and I don't like it to, well, it's only this depression. Yeah. Did I ask this depression to come up? No. Well, whose is it then? Why are you taking it personally? It's only a feeling. Yeah. You can't make that feeling change. Yeah. You have to let it be by itself, relax and smile. Yeah. In fact, the latest research in depression is, uh, is pointing out to this that a lot of cognitive therapy techniques are being borrowed to add more nurturing activities so that you can reframe and decenter yourself from depressive feelings when they arise. And, uh, and, and, and that's that, mindfulness. Yeah, absolutely, right that, that, that's mindfulness and they are bringing the focus back more and more to engaging in more nurturing activities at the time when those depressive feelings arises, nothing is more nurturing than having a smile. So, <laughs> so I think science is eventually even uh, the <coughs> psychiatric they'll, they'll science. They'll learn eventually. They, 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 yeah, yeah. 
We have used the word feeling many times. If I'm not mistaken, the original Pali word is Vedana. Right. And, uh, and it is, Vedana itself is different from how in English sometimes we understand feeling as, as an emotional feeling. You know, right. there can be an eye feeling, there can be an ear feeling. So I was hoping that for people to get the right context of uh, 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 when you say depression is a feeling, if you could say a little I'm, bit I'm about feeling I'm talking what feeling about is. an emotional feeling, your habitual tendencies. tendencies. I always think this when that arises. arises. Now, that has nothing to do with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with your awareness. That happens just because of your old habit of acting this way when that arises. When you start practicing and understanding feeling is only pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, it's not emotion, and it's not yours personally. <laughs> a feeling arises. You have a pain in your knee. Did you ask that pain to come up? It just came up. Did you say, I want this pain. I haven't <laughs> had pain for a long time. <laughs> no, nobody's going to do that. Yeah. You're seeing more and more clearly how the process works. And when you start seeing how this process works, then you'll start letting go of it more and more easily. easily yeah. One of the things that I tell my students a lot is that you have to stop being hard on yourself. You have to start being kind to yourself. You're going to make a mistake. Then you're going to think about how dumb you were <laughs> and how much you, sh you shouldn't have done it, yeah. and it's going to come up over and over and again. over again. Yeah. That's habitual emotional tendency. Yeah. So you have to learn, no, I made a mistake. Yeah. Okay, I forgive myself for making a mistake. Yeah. I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. Why do I can criticize myself when I make a mistake? You need to be kind to yourself. You need to be grateful that you made a mistake because that way you won't do it again. <laughs> and the more you practice gratitude, yeah. the clearer your mind becomes. Yeah. In fact, it's been, the studies have shown that depression, uh, the leading indicator of depression is self-critical thoughts, judgment and evaluation that works at a ruminating uh, process and they call it the vicious cycle yeah. because every negative self-critical thought brings out more self-critical thought, more self-critical thought and then eventually it becomes anxiety and over a period of time depression. So what you said is so, so consistent with what people are finding. Laugh. Laugh. Smile and laugh. You make a mistake. <laughs> okay, fine. So what? What's the big deal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time you laugh, you let go of that false belief in a personal self, and I'm dumb and I don't like it. <laughs> you let go of that. Mandi, I'd like to pick up a theme oh, in, in your last answer. Uh, you talked about one of the misunderstandings people can have that... Uh, Buddhism is a religion, and yeah. I think, uh, and in all fairness, I think part of it is also fueled by how Buddhism is practiced in some parts of the world, you right. know, the temples and rituals and rites and, and the flutes and everything else, and, and obviously, uh, you know, your teachings go right back to the suttas, the original uh, words of Buddha, so to say, as, as closely preserved as possible. May I draw you into an inquiry as to what do you see is the future of Buddhism, given all that's happened to the world and all that's happened to the teachings of Buddha now? Well, believe it or not, I see Buddhism softening the blow of the dissatisfaction and dislike of what's happening right now. Yes. And it's starting to change things. <laughs> uh, that's, I was in Asia for 12 years. I came back to this country <laughs> to help soften the blow. blow and, yeah. and I teach people how to be happy. Happy, yeah. And when they're happy, then they say, well, I want to be a teacher. Yeah. Okay, you teach by your example. Example, absolutely. And you teach other people how to smile and laugh. 
and have fun. <laughs> when, when you first came, that was one of the first things I said to you. You're not laughing enough. <laughs> you need to laugh more. I remember you were sitting on the right and you were playing with the dog and, yeah. uh, and I was busy with my food and he said, you need to laugh more. It took me a while to get, get hold of that one. That was a good one. Uh, now I imagine you saying that. Every time I get too serious. <laughs> if Bhante was here, he would tell me you need to laugh more. Welcome back to the part two of our conversation with Bhante Vimalaramsi. Uh, Bhante, welcome back from the break. Thank you. And uh, so the second part of the conversation, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into the teachings uh, of Dhamma and, uh, and the words of Buddha. There is this... Uh, now, there are many uh, styles of meditation that are taught around the world. Very often I have uh, students that come to me who relate to meditation as a concentration absorption meditation. And you're one of the f foremost, I would say, in some sense, a unique North Star in that area who has gone back to the original suttas and has actually bridged the understanding to what was really meant and how different it is from concentration as it's understood. I would love for you to share some of that uh, wisdom with our listeners. Okay. One-pointed concentration or absorption concentration is this. Your mind is on an object of meditation. I don't care what that object is. It can be the breath. It can be loving kindness. It can be staring at a candle. It can be anything. Now, your mind gets distracted you have a thought that pulls your attention away. One-pointed concentration or absorption concentration is this. You see that your mind is not with your object of meditation. And immediately you drop the thought or the feeling, whatever it happens to be, that distracted you and come back to your object of meditation. Now, what happens is you do that enough that you're going to start staying on your object of meditation. Absolutely. And your, your sense of concentration is going to get so deep that it suppresses the hindrances. It stops hindrances from coming up. So you don't have distractions. Now, what that means also is that your mind will start to get into a state of bliss where it's very peaceful and very uh, at ease. And you stay there for a period of time and you think, this is it. <laughs> this is really the best meditation I've ever, ever run across. Been. Yeah, true. I'm quiet, I'm peaceful. Yeah. But when you break your sitting and you're not in that deep state of concentration, you still have the same kind of problems that you had before you started. You still have the anger, the dissatisfaction, the sadness. And then you want to run back into that state because it was so peaceful. And that's what's happening with yeah. almost everybody right. that's doing meditation. Yeah, a lot of people are like that. They're, they're suppressing the hindrances and they just want to feel good. <laughs> now, when you're practicing what I teach, your mind is on your object of meditation, that's the same. Your mind gets distracted, that's the same. Now, here is what the difference is. Now, you let that distraction be there by itself. You don't keep your attention on it. You don't push it away. You don't try to force it away. You just don't keep your attention on it anymore and relax that tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. And bring up something wholesome. Smile. And bring that smiling, happy mind that's pure and clear back to your object of meditation. So with one-pointed concentration, you don't recognize the craving 
and you're bringing craving back to your object of meditation and that causes the concentration to get deeper and, and deeper. deeper. Yeah. And it stops the hindrances from arising while you're in that state. When you're practicing the way that I'm teaching you, you recognize hindrances when they come up and you allow them to be there by themselves and relax, you let go of the craving. So right now you've purified your mind. When you don't let go of craving, then you're going to keep that craving and not be able to recognize, recognize it. Yeah, absolutely. So true. And I know that there are some people that say, there's only one kind of jhana. <laughs> now, yeah, there, there jhana, is. There is jhana yeah. is a word that's very much misunderstood. Yeah, true. Jhana means a level of your understanding, a level of your being able to see and teach yourself how to let go of craving. Almost everybody that teaches uh, absorption meditation, they say, jhana means concentration. <laughs> now, this is a word that I don't use very often yeah. because it's so misunderstood. Yeah. You see somebody that's playing baseball and they get a close-up of the guy's eyes and he's ready to hit the ball, and they say, look at that concentration. <laughs> yeah. Now, he's not distracted at all. He's, yeah. he, he sees how all of these different parts of the ball moving towards him yeah. and how to adjust, and that's concentration. Appreciate. But it's not letting go of the craving. Yep. One of the things is when you recognize the letting go of craving, you become more efficient with whatever you're doing because you'll be able to recognize the hindrances when they come up and pull you away. I taught uh, a lot of college students and they have a big test coming at the end of the year and they're all excited and they're all dreading that, uh, that test. And I ask them, when you're studying, does your mind get pulled away? Do you start worrying about whether you're going to do well on the test or not? Well, yeah, all the time. Why? Why are you worrying about something that hasn't even happened, happened yet? yet. Yeah. Why don't you recognize it, let it be there by yourself, by itself, take a breath, and come back, and laugh with yourself for getting pulled away. When you do that, all of a sudden your mind starts staying on what you're reading and you don't have to go over it again and again and again because you got distracted. distracted yeah. So you become more efficient with what you're doing while you're doing it. Okay. And that makes life more fun. Oh, it does. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's why you call your technique of meditation as tranquil wisdom inside yeah. uh, meditation and uh, you know before i had the opportunity to uh, study with uh, with bhante vimalaramsi i had also practiced a different form of concentration meditation as one of the techniques i was trained in and I, and i know exactly what you, what you said about fighting your mind with mind using your yeah. mind to suppress the mind it it can lead you to sometimes literally have a Headache. Uh, yeah, it can le it it. lead you to the crazy, crazy house too. Absolutely, absolutely. And so TWIM is actually a very wonderful technique uh, that uh, Bhante Vimla Ramsey has been teaching for, for quite a while now and leading retreats, has trained retreat leaders who are now going out and teaching and some of them are my good personal friends. I've had the pleasure to come to know them through, uh, through Bhante. And there's a very nice book, so we will talk about the book towards the end of it in which... Uh, Bhante talks about the twin technique. Bhante, now, in this subject, uh, with your permission, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into aspects of 
as much as you clarified in the first part that Buddhism is not a religion, right? However, any organized practice, people need to put a label to it, right? And uh, and some people will always think of it as a religion. Yeah. And what, what that will bring up, not necessarily in a bad way, you know, I mean, uh, religion doesn't mean we have to defend it. And uh, the uh, I would like to draw some attention to some concepts that people who are not familiar with Eastern faiths, per se, tend to have a challenge understanding what they really mean. And I, I can imagine you can guess what I'm going to ask you about. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about the Buddhist principle of rebirth, right? Because in, the, in most Abrahamic religions, as practiced, uh, um, uh, as practiced by common people, uh, the concept of reincarnation and or rebirth, and I understand they're different. Yeah. So would you like to say a little bit about what the Buddhist concept of rebirth is and how it differentiates from the Hindu concept of reincarnation? Yeah. And this is something that if you practice meditation, you will be able to see this for yourself. If you're practicing with the six arts. Six arts, absolutely. Rebirth, uh, a lot of people, I know that there's uh, uh, some big teachers that they don't, I don't believe in rebirth. Yeah. Okay. Tell me what you did when you were 10 years old. <laughs> Are you the same person now? No. Oh, that means you're reborn, right? Yeah. Reincarnation is something that the Dalai Lama is into. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm gonna die from this this existence and be reborn as a human being and carry on with things like that. And that is a very superficial way of looking at things. Now, I teach you in meditation how to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. Right. Yeah. Now, that was roughly a hundred thousand arising and passing Passing. away of sound consciousness. When you see me talking and you hear me talking, you think that's happening at the same time. One of the principles of Buddhism is that things only happen one thing at a time. (laughs) So when you're hearing me, you're not seeing me, although it's happening so fast that you think it is. You think this is the way it is. I teach meditation to a degree where you will be able to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. And you'll see this for yourself. And this is called birth and death of one consciousness. And it happens very, very fast. Reincarnation implies the same consciousness goes from one body to the next, to the next, to the next. The way the Buddha teaches is that consciousnesses are continually arising and passing away. And there's birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, continually happening. That's why this is called rebirth not reincarnation. Uh, The Buddha never taught reincarnation. Hmm. I don't really understand how some Buddhists can think that there is. (laughs) But I, I do understand that when Buddhism became popular, it went from one country to another country to another country, and things got changed. Yeah. That's why it's important to go back to the, as close to the original teachings as you can go. Yeah. Now, mindfulness of breathing. A lot of people are doing the breath meditation. 
and they're told, put your attention on your nostril tip. <laughs> put your attention on your upper lip. Put your attention on your abdomen. Right. And focus on the breath. It doesn't say that in the instructions. No, it does not. Not in the sutta. It says you understand when you take a long breath, breath. or short breath. short breath. Understand means that you know that your breath is long when it's long and when it's short. But it is short. When, it, when it's fast, when it's slow, you know all of these things. And knowing is observing. The next part of the instructions is on the in-breath you tranquilize the bodily, or the, uh, you experience yes. the entire bodily That's formation. Yeah. Okay? Now, that means that you know what's happening in your body okay. on the in-breath and on the out-breath. You use the breath as the reminder to relax that tension and tightness in your head and your mind. And that's what the next part of the instructions the say. Yeah. The instructions in mindfulness and breathing are very, very simple. Yeah. I practiced 20 years a method of mindfulness of breathing, watching the abdomen for 20 years, <laughs> and I still didn't understand what they were talking about with those instructions. So it's not focus on the breath, it's use the breath as the reminder to relax. Yeah. You relax on the in-breath, you relax on the out-breath. I teach loving-kindness meditation because I like to see people progress in meditation very fast. Loving kindness is a way of wishing someone else happiness, happiness yeah. and feeling that happiness and radiating that happiness to them. And it's a meditation that you can take with you in your daily life. When you're walking from here to your car, what are you doing with your mind? Thinking this, thinking that. When you start practicing loving kindness, you start radiating loving kindness to all beings. You see some birds out there, wish them happiness. And it helps uplift your mind. Absolutely. And then you give it away. See, that comes back to what meditation actually is. is. Yeah. The more you can smile during the day and wish somebody happiness, the more you're practicing your generosity. Yeah. And the happier you become. And then sometimes you'll be walking and you're not thinking about that and you'll walk by somebody and they, they smile at you. And, oh, thanks. Yeah. They help remind you, oh, this is what I want to be doing. <laughs> and it leads to a mind that's more gentle more balanced. The highest feeling that you can experience in the meditation is equanimity. Mm. And that means balance. Mm. Somebody can come at you with their, their anger and you don't take it as yours personally. You look at them and you wish them happiness. That takes their anger away. One of the things that the Buddha said is you can never overcome hatred by hatred. But how many times are we trying to do that, especially with the way politics in the world are, <laughs> is working right now? <laughs> Not a great day to talk about it today. <laughs> you just get people yelling at each, each other, other and they're not listening to each other at all. Yeah, true. So... Instead of doing that, wish them happiness. Yeah. Their mind calms down. I've seen it happen thousands of times. Yeah, yeah. And radiate loving kindness into the situation. Yeah. And when you do that, you become more focused in what you're doing. Yeah. You're more successful with what you're doing. And the people that you're working with become happy because 
you're giving them the example of being happy. happy. And that's what loving kindness yeah. is about. Yeah. Sometimes I like to say, you know, being loving, kind and happy is contagious. As contagious as being sad and complaining is. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going to be, a, if you're going to contaminate people, contaminate them with joy yeah. and happiness. Uh, in the corporate world today, Bhante, we work routinely with uh, corporate clients where there are deadlines and demands and pressures to perform, and and uh, they all often approach us that uh, how might they integrate mindfulness into the workplace. How might leaders integrate mindfulness into their leadership style? So I wonder if you have some, I know you don't like calling them tips, but if you have some well, practices I, yeah, to share. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, the thing that r almost nobody really understands is how easy it is to get distracted away from what you're doing while you're doing it. Absolutely. You're focusing on this and somebody comes and asks you a question. question. And, and then you have an emotional reaction to that. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't have done that. Done that why, yeah. do you, why are you bothering me now? Yeah. Okay. So when you're practicing equanimity, it's okay yeah. and you become more efficient. You don't have thoughts. See, somebody comes up and they say something to you. You might not like it. They go away. What do you think about? <laughs> Why did you say you that to me? Are you thinking about what you should be thinking about, or what they just got through saying, and how yeah. much you don't like it? Yeah. How much pain do you cause yourself because of that? Yeah. When you have good equanimity, when you have good balance of mind, it doesn't matter what somebody else says to you. They can have their opinion. Fine. That doesn't mean you have to make it your opinion or your dislike of an opinion and fight with it. You have to change, or for that matter, change their opinion. You don't they have can, to change their opinion. They can keep it. They can keep their opinion. Yeah. It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. But it's the balance of mind that strikes them. And they, they see that you can go back to work and, and not be distracted at all. And that impresses them. The way you become a teacher is by example. And the more you can be an example of balance and happiness, the more you affect everybody around you. And then everybody starts to become more efficient. So this practice is about life. It's not this practice and then I'm going to go do this or I'm going to go think about this. No, you think about this and don't let yourself be distracted. Even if somebody comes up and they try to distract you, you can go back to it very easy because you're not making a big deal of the distraction. No, that's very good. I, I, I completely agree. In fact, the, t the pressure in the corporate world is so much about multitasking that, I mean, I've never, I've never really understood how can you be doing more than one task at a time. Right. It's really badly. And, and you don't do any task That's very well. Very well, absolutely. When you're multitasking. Yeah, absolutely. I have a student that got upset because she used to multitask all the time. <laughs> and she practiced with me and she said, now I can't multitask. Yeah. I have to do this and get it done and get it done right before I do something else. Yeah. And I said, yeah, and how much more efficient are you? You get more done during the day when you don't multitask. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, the, 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 the concept of multitasking, just a trivia, uh, comes from the world of computers. When first powerful computers were developed, they could do more than one task uh, at a time. That did not mean that at the same time they were doing ta two tasks. It just meant they were completing tasks faster so that they can do more tasks in less time. Yeah. It was actually a measure of efficiency and productivity. It wasn't a measure of how di distributed, uh, scattered the yeah. mind was. But the thing is, if you try multitasking, you might forget something. Yeah, yeah. And then you got to come back and, and do it. redo it again. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, are you being efficient by doing it that no, way? No, it's not. And that's that's the problem yeah. with retasking. Yeah, yeah. And people are not very good one when of the they're things, doing it that one way. One of the things we try when we practice at IAM is called the touch once rule. Once you touch a task, you finish it, but you, so you don't have to touch it again. Right. So we call it the touch once rule. If you open this, you finish it and get out of it. The, the ability to focus when I was, uh, you know, in, in my study of psychology and human cognition, during the early 2000s, you could find 18 to 20 minutes of concentration, as in uh, the ability to stick to a task before you were disrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the same study was repeated in 2012. It was down to eight minutes. Yeah. Now the average that's trending, and I was just reading uh, some research that came out uh, from from neuropsychologists now uh, is that uh, it's down to two and a half minutes. Yeah, that yeah. every two and a half minutes, people need to to distract and do something different to get that dopamine shot. That 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 sense of well being is coming. Oh, I'm trying to do many things. So we call it, you know, v running. You know, being very busy in life, accomplishing nothing. Different you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to productivity and activity. Yeah. But they, you also worked a lot in the prisons. Yeah. teaching and, and in medium security prisons, you know, in, yeah. in tough prisons. And uh, would you like to share a little bit of, of that anecdote? Well, I, I gave them, a, I give them talks on the advantage of, of learning how to be happy and the advantages of not taking things personally. personally yeah. We finally set up uh, that we would come once a month and for one week, I would give them a retreat. And it started at 8 o'clock in the morning, stopped at 8 o'clock at night. But the advantages of them learning how to use the six R's and how to not react all the time when somebody says something you don't like and then you fight with them, uh, then they learn that they can accept things without getting highly emotional. They started developing their equanimity. And it got so, at this one, one prison, that when prisoners get together, they yell. They're always making noise. It's never quiet. So they wanted to come and sit in meditation, and it wasn't quiet. So it was hard for them. They finally convinced the warden to give them another building to be in, where they could go in and sit. And the guards were very much shocked by this. And they would go in and sit in meditation with the prisoners. And that was kind of a new concept for them. For them. They'd, they'd never done that before. And it's just a matter of being more aware of things that make you unhappy and letting that go. And the unhappy things are things that you've already made an opinion about, I don't like this, and then you beat yourself up because of that. And you wind up causing yourself more and more pain. Yeah. I got them to start smiling. And then the man would come in, their prisoner, a guard, and they would see that they're happy and they're not causing any problems, and they would go in and just wreck the room and uh, throw all the stuff around and break stuff. And this one man, he was known for being angry, and he was thrown in the hole, the isolation, for at, at least a week per month. I mean, he, he was always getting in trouble. And after I taught him this, and I got him to start seeing the sense of it, right after a meditation class, he went back to his, his room, and the guards came in, and they tore his room up. And he didn't respond with anger. He just looked at him, and he kind of smiled a little bit. And then, as they were leaving, he said, thank you very much. You've given me a chance to clean out a lot of stuff. 
and they didn't know how to handle it. And after, it was about a month, then they started letting him go out so he could be outside and work in the garden because he had changed his perspective and he changed the dislike that he had and taking it personally and causing himself, himself so much pain, he started seeing there's a different way and a different perspective that you can use. And I, I was there for about a year at this one uh, prison. And when I left, they were going through major changes because even the Muslims, who are very militant at times, were starting to come to the class for meditation and learning about how to let go of these painful feelings and painful actions. So they went through a major change in, in that prison just by a few people being an example of how to be happy and how to accept and how to not resist everything that happens to them. So the meditation becomes something that's very practical. It's not something that you have to pray to another god. To, yeah, yeah. You don't pray to somebody else to help you overcome the problem. The essence of meditation, the essence of Buddhism is self-responsibility. Take care of yourself. The more happy you become, the more you affect people around you. Absolutely. And if you want to be happy in your place, wherever you live, you have to practice being happy. happy. And Absolutely. that's what meditation does. does. Well, Monty, that was a fantastic finale to our <laughs> conversation. Because, well, not, uh, luckily, not a lot of the world is logged in prison, but almost everyone seems to be logged in the prison of modern life, of distraction and demands and the suffering that comes from it. Yeah. And you're teaching about how to make the circumstances of that transform by changing your perspective is a lesson that we can all learn and benefit from. And thank you once again, Bhante, for sharing that wisdom uh, with us. It is my greatest is pleasure to do that. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And we hope that we will see you again and we will have a chance to have more conversation okay. and with you. That would be good. Likewise.